Okay, uh, good morning and welcome. Uh, let's pray and uh, we will begin with our course on Hebrews, um, uh, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, uh, as well as Jude. So I would like to request uh, any one of our um, uh, class here to please lead us in prayer. I'll pray. Yes, please. Pray, Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that you've given us. Father, we thank you because we are coming into your presence, Father. Thank you for blessing Teacher Nancy to come back and guide us in this course, Father. Permit her into thy mighty hands, Father, the power that you're going to teach her with enough knowledge, Father, so that we can withdraw from her also. Father, we commit all the students, Father, into thy hands. Whatever we're going to learn, Father, dear, but let it not depart from our hearts and our minds. Living, permitting everything in the mighty hands of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kennedy. Hope uh, each one of you is doing well. Hope uh, you had a good break, uh, Christmas, New Year's, and you're back with uh, uh, great energy. This is your last semester, uh, and I know that uh, most of us on this course, we are completing our three years here at APC Bible College. So uh, firstly, a huge congratulations to all of you. Just one semester away from uh, completing your uh, BTH degree, and I really appreciate uh, your commitment uh, as well as hard work all these um, semesters for just staying on course uh, and uh, continuing to desire uh, you know the word of God continuing to learn from God's word and I believe that this final semester will um, strengthen you um, just as much as all the other semesters did uh, but uh, uh, you know just just continue on till the finish line and uh, make sure uh, you complete the course so uh, as I shared we are going to look at uh, um, five different books of the Bible in this particular course. So there's going to be Hebrews, there will be James, 1st and 2nd Peter, as well as Jude. So what we will do is we will um, uh, try and give most of our time to Hebrews because uh, there's, there's a a lot to understand right there uh, but we will pick up pace towards the end of uh, this particular book and then you know we will uh, begin with the other books as well and i'm sure we will be able to uh, allot sufficient time for all the books and complete it well so starting off with uh, the book of hebrews here uh, we see that this book this particular book you know it can be dated back to somewhere around 67 to 69 ad and um, this is a duration where the first century church uh, lived and uh, we know that there were believers from uh, different walks of uh, society uh, we know that there were many hebrew believers hebrew believers meaning those who belong to the jewish culture and the jewish tradition you know, they were also now believers in the lord jesus christ and the church was thriving you know, we've done the book of acts so um, you know we've understood how um, so many came to put their faith in the Lord Jesus. And this was a time when um, they were all growing uh, in the faith. They were all taking uh, the word to different um, regions. So 67 to 69 AD, that's uh, when this book was likely um, it, it, it was written. So the literary form, as we study um, uh, the writing of Hebrews, it's more like an essay. Uh, so you would notice uh, generally when we read Paul's letters, we have uh, uh, a beginning and a greeting and he has a, a certain format that he follows. However, this format doesn't look similar to that uh, yeah, in the sense that it's more like an essay. He whoever is a writer of the book of Hebrews, he puts out he or she puts out uh, their thoughts and uh, towards the end of the book of hebrews it's more like a letter you know with some instructions some greetings and all of that so that's how the literary form of this particular book is 
who was this book written to now, this book was written to jewish christians who as i've already shared with us uh, we call <coughs> them the hebrews okay so the jewish christians were the recipients of this book so what was so special uh, about this particular message to the jewish christians um, they were at this point though they were in christ they were passionate about this new found faith in the lord jesus christ they were also you could say um, uh, discouraged to some extent okay they were definitely persecuted as well uh, for the sake of the gospel now why were they um, uh, both passionate to to continue in the lord and at the same time discouraged because uh, you see they came from the jewish traditions and uh, once they gave their lives to christ uh, they were discriminated against you know, the others who continued as uh, jewish um, uh, uh in uh, those who continued their contemporaries in the uh, you know the faith of judaism um they did not accept the jewish believers in christ anymore uh, and uh, uh, there were many laws you know, that kind of kept them out of receiving um, uh, property receiving certain rights receiving certain opportunities and so all of this made life more difficult for these jewish christians uh, and this is the reason why the writer of the hebrews as you read you would find that uh, he talks about the worth and value of uh, the faith in the lord jesus christ but he also at many points brings encouragement as well as a warning and he says you know don't don't neglect your faith don't uh, drift away from your faith so he's warning these believers uh, because it was very important otherwise they would have looked at their uh, present circumstances and they would have you know been very very discouraged and let go of their christian faith so this is the audience that the author is speaking to so uh, who really is the author of this book of hebrews now this is the question you know which uh, does not have a straightforward answer um, you have many schools of thought that say that paul is the uh, actual writer of uh, the book of hebrews but then you know looking at the format and the language in which it is written uh, people uh, people say that it couldn't have been paul you know it's it could have been somebody else who actually wrote this letter but there are people who uh, look at some of the content of the book of hebrews and say hey uh, whoever is the writer is very knowledgeable uh, in the jewish scriptures so it may have been paul so there are people who are contending this thought that paul wrote it uh, and uh, you know some are saying yes paul wrote it some others are saying no it cannot be paul because uh, this is not like paul's style of writing so who really is the writer of the book of hebrews now uh, people uh, point to uh, the the language in which it was written so uh, it was actually written in greek okay so this book was written in the greek uh, language and uh, as you read uh, uh, hebrews 11:32 there from the um, uh, from the way it is written in masculine grammar uh, people say that it was a man who actually wrote the book of hebrews and so there are speculations you know people some people say maybe barnabas wrote it okay because he was also a uh, sort of a father figure for the early church uh, there are others looking at the um, knowledgeable uh, you know knowledgeable uh, expression of of this particular book they they say that maybe apollos because remember we saw in the book of acts that apollos was a man who was well versed in scripture so there are people who say that you know apollos could have been the writer now there are other names that come up from time to time so we have no idea uh, you know exactly 
who wrote the book of hebrews so because of the masculine grammar uh, all these people are uh, attributed with the uh, authorship of the book so you have apostle paul uh, likely to be barnabas likely to be uh, apollos but there is a school of thought where people also say that the writer could have been a lady okay so now this is a, a, a bunch of people who who speculate that priscilla okay remember we we read about aquila priscilla in corinth who came and who worked alongside paul so she was also a good teacher of the word of god and, and so people say that it's likely to be priscilla so we don't know uh, and uh, uh, when you probably have heard sermons from the book of hebrews uh, you may have heard this statement people say the writer of the hebrews the writer of the hebrews because we don't really um, we cannot put a finger on a particular person and say hey so and so is the writer so it's up to you now you can subscribe to any school of thought that you uh, are convinced about so uh, as i've been saying uh, what is the purpose of this particular uh, letter uh, this letter firstly was written to reveal and establish jesus christ to the uh, greek mindset okay so uh, they they used to the jewish traditions but completely accepting jesus christ for who he is you know that was a struggle uh, that they had so uh, a primary thrust through the book you will notice is on the lord jesus christ and revealing him to people of the greek mindset then we will notice that the writer talks about the greatness of the redemption of the lord jesus christ because these believers as we've been saying you know they had left their jewish traditions and they thought that that was the greatest you know that is what god had given them but now they've left those traditions those rituals and they've come to believe in the lord jesus christ uh, but they needed this revelation that what they are walking in right now is greater than what they had been practicing all along so as we get into the book of hebrews you will notice that you know, we will talk about uh, the the fact that the temple practices were actually a shadow and that the lord jesus is the actual fulfillment and so the writer will help the audience understand that what you have right now the redemption that the lord jesus christ brought for us is greater then all the uh, rituals of sacrifices and you know everything that they were actually involved in so uh, that is another purpose why this book was written and of course you know we will find uh, exhortation or encouragement to the persecuted and discouraged christians of this time uh, so they were encouraged to continue in christ you know don't let go of your faith because things are hard but continue in the uh, faith that you have know the supremacy of our lord jesus christ and his faithfulness so this is the way in which the author will actually encourage the believers and of course we said that it also has warnings so we will find that um, uh, you know time to time uh, there there will be a, a hard message to the listeners where the author is saying come on you know don't drift away if you drift away uh, uh, like it's even in, you can even cross the uh, border or, or the boundary from where it may be impossible for you to return so there are these real warnings in the book of hebrews as well so uh, on one side 
there's all this encouragement but on the other side there uh, is a set of warning so this is what the book of hebrews carries for us so just before i uh, get into hebrews chapter 1 um i thought you know i would ask us uh, i'm sure you know you've you've gone through the study of hebrews uh, from different places different sources so any any uh, of of your views about the book of hebrews before we get into the details uh yes yes see please go ahead yeah thank you master uh i learned this from a preacher and uh, when i was reading the book of hebrews i discovered that truly Hebrews is kind of like the Leviticus of the New Testament. In the sense that Leviticus had so many ordinances and things that they were supposed to keep, sacrifices that God prescribed the way the priest. So in a way, the book of Hebrews kind of um, opens up all those things that were done in Leviticus, shows the significance in Christ, like opens up the new chapter of where we are in this dispensation. So Hebrews, in a way, it's kind of like the Leviticus book of the New Testament or the New Covenant that we're in. Then another thing that uh, I know about the book of Hebrews is that it's centered more on Jesus and his finished works pertaining to the church and the dispensation of grace that we've come into. That, that's just a bit of what I know about Hebrews. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Say, for sharing your views. Um, and we would notice as we go through this book that it's also one of those books where the Old Testament is quoted quite a bit. Okay. So obviously, I, I already said that the author has very good knowledge of um, uh, scriptures uh, and uh, he will bring those scriptures and from the scriptures try to establish the supremacy of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Old Testament is quoted quite a bit, you know, because say mentioned something like uh, Leviticus. But uh, as I already mentioned earlier, uh, we will, though Old Testament is quoted, we will have the emphasis on the new covenant. And uh, Hebrews will really talk about the Old Testament scriptures in the light of the new covenant. So it's not so much promoting the old traditions, but it's it's more of understanding the traditions, um, uh, the temple practices in the light of what the Lord Jesus has actually fulfilled now. So that's the way in which it would go. Uh, and I'm just looking at uh, our uh, chat here and we are says very insightful book have many favorite verses in this book okay that's great um so oh she's quoting all her favorite uh, scriptures here uh, thanks divya thank you so much for uh, sharing each one of them uh, i know that we will dwell on uh, all these passages very soon so uh, thank you everyone for you know, sharing your views about the book of Hebrews. So uh, coming to chapter one of Hebrews, um, uh, this particular chapter, okay, um, what do we see here? I, I'll kind of summarize it right at the start and then uh, get into the passage. So here, we have uh, an exhortation where the author of the book of Hebrews, he is establishing the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we go through the first chapter, there are a couple of points that he will make. He will make the point that the Lord Jesus is the begotten son of God. Okay. Uh, then he will establish that Jesus Christ is far superior to the angels. And the comparison is that the Lord Jesus is the begotten son, but the angels are created beings. Okay. Then we will see how he talks about the Lord Jesus as the one who reigns 
forever. He will also talk about the Lord Jesus as the heir of God, as the creator, the ruler, and the one who is worthy of worship. The Lord Jesus um, uh, will also be talked about as deity, or in other words, as God, who, is, who shares in the attributes of the Father. And we will see that the Lord Jesus is highly favored by the Father and also highly exalted. Now, this was very, very important for the persecuted and discouraged Christians. Okay, The reason is they would have felt that, oh, we had such a rich tradition. And, um, you know, we were followers of uh, Jehovah God and, uh, you know, a, a certain certain kind of lifestyle um, that we had. Now we've left behind everything uh, and, you know, we are being ostracized by our um, uh, brothers and sisters of, of the tradition. And now we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the value of this new faith? Right? Uh, why did we even leave everything behind and go after this Jesus? Well, they may have had those questions in their low moments. And so it was very important for the writer of the Hebrews to let them know that what you have right now, the value of the faith that you carry right now is incredible. You know, it's not even comparable to what you put your faith in earlier on. And so that is why he's starting out uh, this letter to these Christians uh, by establishing the supremacy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And see how he starts. You know, He starts uh, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. He says, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in the time past to the fathers by the prophets. So he is not even uh, trying to give an explanation about God. He is straight away, you know, beginning with the term God to the believers. And, you know, in a sense, it's like his confidence, the writer's confidence in the fact that you should know by now that there is a creator God and, you know, that uh, we really don't have to make a case for this God. He exists and, you know, he is supreme. He is almighty. And so, which is why he just starts the writing with God who at various times and various ways spoke. And so he is introducing this God uh, to the believers as a God who has existed. Okay. So no apologies for the existence of God or no explanation for the existence of God. He's so great. He has existed. And the second uh, fact he says there is who in various ways spoke in time past. So he is introducing an existing God and a speaking God. Okay. So beautiful. He says that this God, he was never silent. He always spoke to us. How did he speak to us in the Old Testament? Through the prophets. Okay. So as we just look back at many different incidents uh, in the Old Testament, we would see that God did speak. God spoke uh, to Moses in the wilderness season you know, through a burning bush. We see that God spoke to Elijah. And Elijah, being a prophet, you know, may have expected God to speak in a grand way, in a spectacular way. God spoke to Elijah even through a still, small voice. God spoke to Isaiah through a heavenly vision. Okay, so he saw the uh, this into the spiritual realm, and he saw this vision of God seated on the throne. God was able to speak in any situation. You know, he spoke to Hosea through his own family crisis. God spoke to Amos through a basket of summer fruit. And so, you know, as we consider different incidents in the Old Testament, we see that it was never that difficult for God to communicate himself. And God spoke to different people, different seasons of their lives. And he wanted his message 
to be known by them. So we have a God, a mighty God who existed, meaning he's eternal, and a God who uh, uh, you know, spoke. And we will see that the writer is actually trying to tell us that God is speaking to us right now. And so in verse 2, he says, has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds so what is he saying this speaking god has chosen to speak right now so which are the last days you know we said that the last days when we talk um about um Jesus's uh, ascension and, you know, are waiting for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So once the Lord Jesus completed his earthly ministry, started the last days. So we are still in the last days. Okay, we are still in the last days. So in these last days, how has God spoken? God has spoken, the writer says, by his son. So looking at the Lord Jesus and his life. Um, now again, you know, last days, uh, technically, it's it's a time when, uh, you know, the Lord Jesus, he uh, finished his ministry and he ascended up. However, you know, in this passage, the writer is really saying he spoke through his son. So then he's including um, the ministry of the Lord Jesus here on the earth. But we understand what he's trying to say. He's trying to say that Jesus is a message. Okay? So the Lord Jesus is God's best message. God has spoken through all his prophets, if he had already spoken his best message, you know, he wouldn't um, continue to communicate with us. But here's the fact, his God's best message was his son, Jesus Christ. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it's this greatest message that God has communicated to us. So in these last days, spoken to us by his son. So the more we understand the Lord Jesus, we're able to understand what God is trying to tell us through the life of Jesus Christ. So that's the point he's making to these believers that he's saying, fix your eyes on Jesus, bring your attention to the Lord Jesus, focus on the Lord Jesus, because God has spoken his greatest message to you and me through Jesus. And as we focus on the Lord Jesus, we will begin to understand what God is really saying to us. So that's what he's saying. Listen to the message of our God through his son, Jesus Christ. And then you know, he goes on to say, whom he has appointed heir of all things. So, you know, a little uh, facet by facet, we will begin to see why the Lord Jesus is so great. Now, he said that Jesus is the greatest message that we understood. And now he's pointing to the fact that Jesus is appointed heir of all things. So uh, Jesus being a part of the Godhead, you know, we understand the term heir. Heir uh, simply means that you know, somebody who, um, who has the authority, who has been entrusted with everything. And so the Lord Jesus has been appointed heir of all things through whom he all also he made the worlds so there is a reference here to the fact that jesus had a part to play in creation so through whom he made the worlds okay so we understand that the lord jesus is god's greatest message he is the appointed heir of god and he is also a creator okay he is creator so uh, we are beginning to see, you know, different things about the Lord Jesus. So we understand him better. And verse three, he says, who being the brightness of his glory 
and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high so each uh, scripture you know each verse there is power packed with the attributes of our lord jesus christ in verse 3 you know we notice that jesus is being described as the brightness of his glory so god's glory god wanted us to picture that glory how do we picture that glory god sent his son jesus christ for us to understand the glory of god so in a way in a way okay, just for our understanding it's like saying if we uh, term the the you know the the burning sun okay uh, it, it's like a furnace the sun is burning with all its light all its brightness and everything how do we here on earth experience the sun okay the sun is at a certain distance away from the earth but we have the rays from the sun okay so these rays come the radiance comes and it carries with it the light of the sun the heat of the sun you know many things which are required for us to be able to uh, uh, live our lives here on earth so we can know the sun through the rays okay partly just a little bit just a little bit of what the sun is really like but what the writer is trying to say is you know if we were to think oh the glory of god is like the sun the best way in which god could express his glory is through his son jesus christ so you might say that again you know this illustration is actually not uh, an accurate one but just for our understanding the the brightest um you know the brightest sunlight or the the, the brightest uh, uh, radiance that we experienced of the glory of god is the lord jesus christ okay but just in continuation to that line he also says the express image of his person which is to say that yes jesus is the brightest expression of the glory of god but he is also the most accurate expression you know if we were to look in a mirror at our faces we see the exact image isn't it exact image uh, all the uh, physics enthusiasts would um, argue that hey no but it's not uh, exact because you know it 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 is uh, um it's opposite to who we are so you know having given all that we are not able to describe you know the exact image very accurately but here's the point whoever god is right uh, the lord jesus is the exact image okay he's the exact image so the exact image is something like um, a stamp those of us who understand you know post and envelopes we know that a stamp which uh, uh, has a, a certain image on it if you uh, put that into ink and you start stamping envelopes you get the same same image on every single envelope so that is like the exact image of that particular stamp so what we are being told you know we are trying to understand jesus just in these three verses we are able to understand wow you know jesus um, god has spoken through jesus he is a message from god to us he is the heir he is the creator he uh, is is the brightness of god's glory okay so Uh, he is the brightest expression of of who god is uh, if i want to understand god and of course he is the exact image 
the exact image. So if I want to know um, what Father God is like, what Father God is thinking, uh, what uh, the purposes of his heart are, or what decisions he would make, or how he would uh, react to a, a given situation, you know, we look at the Lord Jesus because he is the exact image. That's what the writer of the Hebrews is saying. Come on, you know, take Jesus uh, serious because he has been given by God to us and he has come to show the Father. He has come to reveal the Father to us. So that is who the Lord Jesus is. And uh, as you know, a statement made by a preacher goes, uh, Jesus Christ is perfect theology. So when we understand the Lord Jesus, you know, we understand who God is and how we, we're trying to study God. And so <clears throat> when we study the Lord Jesus, we are able to uh, get the heart of God, understand the very heart and the life of God. Okay. Right. So uh, I hope you're all with me, or is it uh, a little too hi-fi flying over our heads? So is it going okay so far? How's, how is it? Okay, nice. Okay, great. Uh, so in the chat, I can see Christopher is asking, uh, spoke in time past to the uh, fathers, who are the fathers? Okay, so the fathers are um, uh, uh, Christopher. Yeah, so that question was from Christopher. Christopher, uh, uh, in the uh, Jewish tradition, uh, people like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, these were people who were known as the patriarchs. Okay, so they were leading, um, uh, leading men who, who were considered as the fathers. So uh, that is, those are the people that uh, the writer is referring to. Okay, so the fathers. Okay. Okay, wonderful. All right, so let's, uh, let's continue then. So we have an understanding about the Lord Jesus now. So in continuation to talking about how the Lord Jesus is uh, the exact image of God, the writer also says that Jesus did a redemptive work. So he says, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he doesn't take very long to come to the greatness of our Lord Jesus Christ. He starts describing about Jesus and he now talks about what a wonderful work Jesus has done. So he says, he himself, okay, he did not ask an angel or a, some other creature or, you know, assign the responsibility to buy uh, back, you know, our, the redemption of mankind, uh, he did not assign it to anybody else, but he himself okay, dealt with our sins. So that again shows us, you know, this great God is so personal to us that he chose to take the sins which are to bring punishment to us upon himself. And the way he completed this work of redemption is that he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So that's a glimpse of heaven. And, you know, we've talked about the ascension of the Lord Jesus. So what did Jesus do after he completed the work of redemption? See, this picture of sitting down is generally referring to finishing the task. So because Jesus has completed his earthly ministry of redeeming us, he now has sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And we know this. We say Jesus is at the right hand uh, of the Father. He is interceding for us. So this is who the Lord Jesus is to us. And this is what he has done for us. 
verse 4. Having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So you see, we may look at the writing of uh, uh, Hebrews and think, why is this writer talking about uh, all these specific subjects? And now he brings in angels. You know, how does it matter uh, that the people are aware that Jesus is greater than the angels? But you see, we have to understand it from the context of these early Christians. We know that they left their traditions. Okay, So as part of their traditions, angels had a great place of honor for the um, like the Jewish people. And uh, they believed that angels were great. And so now that they have become Christians, the writer had to help them understand Jesus is greater than the angels. Because in some instances, as part of their old faith, they would even worship angels. And so the writer had to, uh, uh, you know, totally um, uh, destroy that, that particular philosophy that they held on to and establish that Jesus is greater than the angels. So what is he saying now? He's saying Jesus has become much better than the angels. Why? He's giving reasons. He has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So Jesus has a better name than the angels. How did he get this name? He's saying by inheritance. Okay, inheritance. So notice, he's trying to help the believers understand Jesus is the son of God. He already mentioned it. He said, Earlier, he has spoken to us by his son. So there is a status that Jesus has, which is greater than the angels. So Jesus is the son and Jesus is the heir. Jesus is the creator. Jesus has a name which is greater than any other name. Okay? A more excellent name because he received it by inheritance. Okay? So why is the name of Jesus great? There are many reasons why his name is great. But here is one reason. It was given to him by inheritance. Simply because he is the son of our heavenly father. Okay. So verse 5. We'll move on to verse 5. So here you would notice uh, that a passage has been quoted from the Psalms and uh, the book of uh, Second Samuel. We'll quickly read it. So from verse 5, I will read all the way to verse 7. He says, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when the when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So uh, the writer is continuing on the same theme that Jesus is greater than the angels. So where are these uh, verses from? These verses have been quoted from Psalm 2. Okay, Psalm 2 and verse 7, uh, and also uh, from 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 14. So here again, the same thing. He's trying to help the believers understand Jesus is the Son. And so he uses this term, finally, begotten, begotten. So when we look at the Greek word, uh, you know, begotten over there. I'm not going to read out the Greek word for us, but it simply means to procreate, to bear, to beget, be born. And so there is only one son who is begotten of the father who is our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's establishing that. And he's saying, 
listen or rather he's asking jesus is the son jesus is begotten of our father now just tell me is there any one angel or to which of the angels did god ever say this that you are my son he never did okay but he did say this to the lord jesus because there is only one begotten son of the father that is the lord jesus and these verses you know, that relationship is established where he says i will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son okay now what we'll do is we'll uh, uh, stop here we will take a um, small break and then we'll come back but before we go in for a break any thoughts any comments Um, Pastor, maybe we'll answer this question in the next class, but yeah. uh, I don't know if I'm going to, um, ahead of ahead of us, but the last verses that we read, <clears throat> that he has made his angels, um, ministers, brings us all to the years of salvation, and then, um, uh, sorry, angels rather, years of salvation, and then the, um, the ministers of fire. Sorry, I'm misquoting it, but somewhere, some, somewhere like that, paraphrasing. Um, my question basically is that a lot of people have actually thought that the word minister is actually talking about pastors or um, servants of God who preach the gospel. But from what we're learning here, the writer of the Hebrew is still talking about the angels. I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm correct to see that. Um, yeah. He's repeating the same thing in a different light, basically. So I just wanted to ask that question. Now. Is it angels or or is that verse referring to, um, is it referring to men of God and women of God of the gospel? Because I've, I've actually heard that a long time since I was a kid, people usually quote that verse and they claim it to be men of god or women of god of the gospel okay um, i don't know if i was right. sure so say let's uh let's come back and we we will uh, um address that that question is is that okay that's fine yes that's totally fine yes okay. thank you Let, let's do that and divya uh, i know you have a question uh, can you hold on to it we'll we'll uh, discuss it in the next session sure sure pastor no problem yeah Sure. So thank you, everyone. Please stay on the same link. Uh, don't uh, log off. I'm just going to stop the recording and then restart the recording on the same call. So have a good break. See you all in 10 minutes. Thank you.